on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to our brand new show, Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Now, coming up in the next couple of hours, a parent's pain. The mothers of hostages being held in Gaza tell Talk TV of their anguish after their children were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists a month ago today. Meanwhile, Israel's president has told us that protests planned for Armistice Day must be banned. Crime and punishment uh, from the centre of the first King's speech in 70 years today. As the government promises to get tough on crime, lengthen jail sentences and give more powers to the police. And dozens of Just Stop Oil protesters have been arrested at the Cenotaph, accused of trying to deface the war memorial. They'll be joining us in the studio in the next hour. All that coming up in the next couple of hours, particularly that harrowing interview we have with the three mothers whose children and other family members were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists last month. It's incredible to think that it's a month ago already. And I, I feel like the world is not shouting enough for the release of these hostages, some of them babies underground now. Well, when you see uh, the interview with these anguished mothers, uh, it will remind us all uh, that when we say there are 200 hostages being held underneath Gaza, every single one of those hostages is a story. They have a family, they have grieving relatives, they have uh, mothers, fathers who are beside themselves with worry. And uh, these three mothers will remind us uh, that uh, every tragedy uh, of war, every story in war is real. Uh, it's a family network. It's a whole kind of infrastructure of pain that these people are going through. So that's what these interviews will be for. Uh, as you quite rightly say, Alex, it's a month on from mm. uh, October the 7th, uh, and we need to remember what uh, Israel's actions are all about right yeah, now. Yeah, this was uh, the, the brutal atrocities committed on the 7th of October. And it's very easy now to get distracted by the focus of the bombardment of Palestine. And so many people calling for the protection of the lives of children there, but among those hostages a little babies there are elderly people mm. many of them women these aren't soldiers these aren't fighters that these terrorists snatched from their own homes places that should be safe for families and have now kept them underground for four weeks and as Israel desperately tries to retrieve those hostages it's so important to hear those first-hand accounts yeah, of the families that's, that's what this is it. about that's why Israel is doing what it's doing all these people calling for a ceasefire mm. Israel is saying we will not uh, instigate a ceasefire until our hostages the hostages being held by Hamas uh, in those dank dark hellhole tunnels beneath Gaza until they're released there's no chance of a ceasefire. And you're going to find out why uh, Israel retains the conviction it has about this situation uh, from these heartbroken mothers. Yeah, and really important as well to remember as more people take to the streets and there is planned activism on Armistice Day, something that the president of Israel told Talk TV exclusively last night uh, should be banned, that it's been revealed that half of those organisations who have been part of planning these marches are directly connected to Hamas. That is very much worth bearing in mind, I think. Yeah, and we'll be t focusing on that. Uh, still a big story. Uh, should the Armistice Day and the Remembrance Day marches, uh, there are planned marches for both days, should they go ahead? A lot of people say no. And there were shocking scenes at um, Edinburgh uh, station shocking, yesterday yeah. where uh, a military veteran, an old war hero, selling uh, uh, pop 78 years old, yeah. was punched to the ground by a pro-Palestine protester as he was caught up in this mass demonstration. Well, I would say that that is not right. Uh, so we'll be discussing that throughout the show. And of course, also, uh, Alex, we need to talk about the King's speech yep. uh, and the opening of Parliament and what the government has planned for us over the next few months. Yeah, Rishi Sunak's uh, words being spoken by King Charles, very clear on Britain's solidarity with Israel and with Ukraine. Yeah. Um, a lot of geopolitics in there, but in many respects, quite wishy-washy 
touchy on other topics. We've got various loose headlines, not so much granular details. So a lot more, I think, to come out on government policy. And this, of course, almost being the pre-manifesto ahead of a general election yeah. planned either next year or potentially as late as January 2025. But ahead of the next budget, it is the Prime Minister's opportunity to lay out his objectives, what he wants to do for the country. And far more importantly, it doesn't look as if Harry and Meghan are going to go to the King's 75th birthday party next week. Mm -mm. Uh, plus, there's a new bombshell book out which uh, lays more claims that the royal family are full of racists and sexists and dinosaurs. So it's a pretty uh, busy week for the royals and we'll be concentrating on that uh, throughout the show. And uh, we'll be joined by Kinsey Schofield, royal commentator, par excellence uh, from uh, California like that, later in the show. Meanwhile, we'd love to hear from you uh, too. Text us on 87222. Do write tweeting you, uh, talking your message, or you can tweet us on X uh, at Talk TV. But first, let's get to the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. In a Talk TV exclusive, three Israeli mothers have been describing the moment their children were kidnapped by Hamas there in the UK to maintain awareness of children taking a month ago today when the terror group crossed into Israel to commit atrocities. Well, the women have lost five children to Hamas and have seen other family members murdered. Release them immediately. Release the children. I, I, we're mothers. We want our children home. We and want children, children are not part of this conflict. Nowhere else. They are victim of this conflict. Exactly. And, and they're victims of this conflict on both sides. So we just want our children back. King Charles has delivered his first King's speech as monarch at the state opening of Parliament. His Majesty's speech marks the start of the parliamentary year and the pledges include proposed laws for tougher sentences for the most serious offenders, an increase in fracking and a smoking ban that will mean today's children can never legally buy cigarettes. While King Charles also said the economy will be a priority. The impact of COVID and the war in Ukraine have created significant long-term challenges for the United Kingdom. That is why my government's priority is to make the difficult but necessary long-term decisions to change this country for the better. My minister's focus is on increasing economic growth and safeguarding the health and security of the British people for generations to come. The family of Captain Sir Tom Moore have lost an appeal after being ordered to demolish an unauthorised home spa in their garden. The celebrated fundraiser's daughter and her husband used the Captain Tom Foundation name on the first plans, with revised plans then turned down by councillors. The organisation's currently being investigated by the Charity Commission. Almost 300,000 women in England are going to be offered a drug that could prevent breast cancer. Recent trials showed the medication can reduce the chances of developing the disease by almost 50% over 11 years. Around 47,000 women in England are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. Amazon workers are going to go on strike in a long-running dispute over pay. Members of the GMB union are expected to walk out for three days and on Black Friday, one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Around 1,000 workers will walk out after criticising a pay offer it said was worth £1 an hour. And house prices rose in October for the first time in six months. Figures from the Halifax show prices rose by 1.1% last month and they put it down to a lack of homes for sale but expect values to fall over the next year. Well, that's the latest. Now time for today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. Well, the weather's going to stay unsettled, dominated as it is, by yet another area of low pressure. And this one is likely to bring some cloud, rain and strong winds tonight. But certainly at the moment, it's mostly showery across the country. And even those showers are tending to transfer eastwards and die out from the west. So for the rest of the afternoon, sunny spells, scattered showers. It's not that warm. Temperatures only around 9 or 10 degrees Celsius in the north, around 12 to 13 in the south. And then, as we go into this evening, it's all change. Clear skies early on will lead to a touch of frost over the northeast of Scotland. Could be some mist and fog there as well. A few showers precede this rain area, which makes its way across Ireland in the early hours and then makes its way into western parts of the UK mainland. Now, on the back edge of this uh, rain belt, you could find some really squally rain and strong winds. In fact, the winds will pick up, could touch gale force at times. So the lowest temperatures overnight occur early in the night and then they start to recover after that as the cloud and the rain moves in. So through Wednesday, Wednesday morning, wet and windy weather across the UK mainland, clearing only slowly from parts of East Anglia and the southeast. And you can see it's going to be quite chilly with temperatures only around 8 to 13 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. Now to our top story and three of the mothers of kidnapped hostages being held by Hamas since the 7th of October attacks a month ago have told Talk TV in an exclusive interview of their anguish. Hadas Calderon, Renana Jacob and Batshiva Yahatomi have nine members of their families taken by the terrorists. Batshiva, whose husband Ohad, along with their eldest son Eitan, is still missing, described the moment the 12-year-old was taken. This was uh, the last moment I saw Eitan, my son. His motorcycle continued to Gaza. Me and my two daughters, we managed to escape through the fields. So we what? went three and a half hours with pyjamas, no shoes, no telephones. They took the, the phones. We don't know anything about Ohad and about Itan, my son. I know Itan is alone. He's only 12. No child should be alone without his mother. Holding back tears, Renana, who wasn't at home at the time of the attack, recounts the last phone call she had with her son, Yejel, uh, who was taken with his 16-year-old brother, Or. The last thing I heard was my 12-year-old, Yegil, begging, saying, don't take me, I'm too young. You can't take me, I'm too young. He was repeating it a couple of times and then the phone hung up and the line went off. And that was the last time I heard of them. Um, as the chapter said, we heard nothing since. We don't know anything of their whereabouts. We don't no know sight. whether they're alive. We don't know. For how long? where they are, whether they're being taken care of. They're children. They're just children. And Hadas Calderin's son and daughter Erez and Saha are still missing, along with three other family members taken from their kibbutz last month. I want you to imagine, any mum in the world, to imagine for one minute, your child, your young little boy or girl, been kidnapped suddenly with, from their safe house with pyjama from, pyjama from their bed. No shoes, no nothing. Just kidnapped like that. Cruelly way. Merciless way, cruelly way. Been holding like that. When they helpless, terrified, confused, Joining us now is Conservative MP Ian Duncan-Smith. Uh, Ian, uh, very powerful testimonies there from uh, the mothers of, three, of the, some of the kidnapped kids, which I think kind of reminds us why Israel is doing what it is. It's strange the way uh, that amid the pro-Palestinian protests, it's almost as if some of the horrors that happened on October the 7th have been forgotten in the mists of time. And to, to hear those mothers, the heartbreak of having their kids wrenched from their arms, being held God knows where now, uh, reminds us why Israel is doing what it's doing. Yeah, um, Hamas knew exactly what they were doing. 
uh, in uh, their first attack, about what, 1,400 people killed, 260, 70 uh, hostages taken. It's also the way they killed the people. They didn't just kill them. Uh, they uh, beheaded them. Uh, they set fire to their bodies. All of this was to make as much of this when they filmed it that would be redolent of the terrible Holocaust and remind the Jews and send a message to the Israelis uh, that this is going to be revisited upon you. That was the purpose of what they did. It wasn't uh, in any way uh, just a killing. These were deliberate filmed uh, shock stories. And then taking the hostages was also a way of defying the Israelis and saying, you know, you can't come and take us because well, we know Hamas uses civilians uh, as human shields. They're doing it right now in Gaza. Uh, there's groups of people that haven't left uh, northern Gaza. Uh, that's because they can't leave northern Gaza because uh, they are the shields that the uh, that Hamas use. So all of this, you know, sometimes I wonder those who have been shouting and complaining about the attacks on Gaza after Hamas have never once referenced uh, the reality that this was brought on uh, to Gaza and Hamas by Hamas quite deliberately. I mean, in uh, an age of information warfare, that sort of grey zone <clears throat> cyber warfare we see uh, very often used, particularly by hostile regimes in the 21st century, we now know, don't we, that uh, at least half of the groups who have been mobilising for these marches are directly Hamas-connected. In fact, a former leader of Hamas, Mohammed Sawala, living in a council house in Barnet, um, I think Rishi Sunak, as Prime Minister, used the King's speech today to express solidarity with Israel. But this is now coming increasingly in the wake of public opinion, albeit potentially driven by the terrorist organisations themselves. How much solidarity can the UK afford to show? Well, I think we have to stand by uh, the Israelis because what they're doing uh, is defending themselves. I know it sounds and looks awful on the pictures, and of course it is, and uh, no innocent child or family member who's killed on either side of this, we, you know, we weep for them because that is uh, the terrible nature of war. But I keep coming back to the fact that the Israelis, I do believe, are doing their level best to make sure they target those areas where there's very distinctly Hamas people. But uh, those Hamas fighters make sure that there are civilians around them. They've operated from under hospitals. Uh, you know, from schools. This is what they do because they, they believe that if Israel strikes them, they can make an issue of it as well. So we need to get this right. And, and Rishi Sunak, I think, has been very bold about this and been very clear, and he's right to say so. The truth about these marches, and I said something about it a couple of days ago, <clears throat> I said that Remembrance Sunday is a, a, well, it's actually Remembrance Weekend because I'm laying wreaths from Friday right the way through to Sunday. Sunday is the culmination, and many of my colleagues are doing the same. So the Remembrance Weekend is a very special weekend for many of us who served uh, and others who didn't serve but want to pay their respects to those who never came back, having fought for the freedoms that these people are now abusing by marching up our streets and often uh, shouting that ghastly slogan from the river to the sea, which means getting rid of the Jews from Palestine. So this has to be stopped, uh, not over this weekend. They have a right to march, but not over this weekend, and we should ban it. Yeah, Ian, I've, I've uh, attended a couple of these marches just to take a look. Uh, I got caught up in them, and uh, hmm. I wouldn't say that they're menacing, and I'm not sure uh, that Suella Bravman is entirely right to categorise them as hate marches, uh, but there's, there's a strange atmosphere about them. Uh, they're vehemently anti-Israel. They're pretty anti-British. Uh, and in terms of these protests planned for this weekend, I think what we have to bear in mind is the shocking scenes we saw yesterday in Edinburgh Station when an old army war veteran selling poppies, 78 years old, was punched to the ground by a pro-Palestinian protester. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is going on when that happens? What are these marches about? Yes, they're pro-Palestine. Yes, they're anti-Israel. But what, are, what else are they? Why is this pro-Palestinian protester punching uh, an innocent uh, war hero poppy seller to the ground? What is that all about? And if that is to be the nature of these marches, <laughs> then I do think we have to think about whether or not they can go ahead. Well, I agree. I thought that uh, scene was shocking, uh, considering that that uh, ex-soldier, like many of my colleagues, 
uh, put their lives on the front line to defend uh, their rights to protest in the first place. So they should be showing respect uh, to those people. They wouldn't have these freedoms to do this in Iran, for example, or they wouldn't be doing it somewhere else in Palestine. The answer is that they are free to protest. That's always been uh, one of the freedoms. But there's a time and a place for everything. And this coming weekend is not the time or the place for them to come and protest during the remembrance uh, uh, organizations, the parades, etc., because they're all about those who fought for their freedoms. Uh, there have been too many people, uh, uh, obviously a minority, who have joined these, uh, these marches and waved Hamas flags and chanted that ghastly slogan and other slogans too, who should be arrested. Uh, you know, the Met have been... I think quite slow about this, uh, really worried about the reaction. The truth is that they have the right both to ban the marches if they think there's a security risk, which it's clear and obvious there will be given scenes like that in Edinburgh. Uh, and at the same time, those who deliberately come uh, to put a very evil slant on it, they should be arrested as well. I spoke to a policeman the other day, I can remain nameless, but he said to me he was drawn down into London uh, only to find that he wasn't allowed to take action against any of these people. He was told just to let the march go on. So you can see there's frustration in many of the rank and file police as well. Yeah, your sentiments are very much echoed by Israel's President Herzog, who spoke exclusively to Piers Morgan yesterday. Let's have a listen to what he said. It's uh, atrocious and hypocritic. And I call upon all decent human beings to object to the march and ban it because the symbol of that day is a symbol of victory and it's, it's a symbol of doing good because when you fight evil, sometimes you have to fight. You have to fight evil in order to uproot evil. I mean, given that we've been discussing the nature of some of the people in these marches, we've had UK intelligence advising us that uh, Tehran themselves have backed, if not sponsored, radical clerics in this country. Uh, we know that they aid and abet, if not arm and fund, places like Hezbollah. We also know that Hamas is one of the best-funded terrorist organisations in the world, with a billion-dollar billion turnover every year. Has the UK, along with the rest, rest of the West, potentially been a bit myopic and naive when it comes to international national foreign policy by increasing trade with Iran, by potentially allowing a fifth column to develop in our own country who is supportive of some of these extremist ideologies? And is it time that we actually see a turning point when it comes to geopolitics? Well, I think there's no question, a lot of people say, that um, the West and even Israel was caught out by this attack. Um, I think we'd all got slightly complacent because there hadn't been huge eruptions in the last uh, past and uh, I think people just thought, well, maybe it's quietening down. The truth was, Iran, I'm absolutely certain of this, has had their hands across all of this for some time. A lot of the financing goes through Iran into these organizations like Hezbollah, which is much bigger than Hamas and Hamas as well. The reality also is that, you know, I just keep questioning the British government as to why we haven't sanctioned the IRGC, the Republican Guard, who report back directly to the clerics. They're not don't report really back to the, to, to the Iranian government. They report back to the real power, which is the clerics in Iran. And, and, and they are responsible for, for so much of this and so much of the sponsoring of clerics, uh, radical clerics, and also uh, arms, advice, all that sort of stuff to Hamas and co. So, so we should at least, I believe, it's high time that we sanction. I'm not alone in this, by the way. Many people like Liam Fox and others have all called for the same, which is we should sanction the IRGC because it's no longer possible for us to say we uh, <clears throat> keep the lines open because it makes it uh, uh, better that way. I think they've gone past the point of no return here and we need to sanction them. As many other countries like America and Europe have done, we seem to be an outlier now. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, thank you so much. Uh, let's bring in uh, Elon Levy now, Israeli government spokesman. Before we chat to Elon, though, let's remind ourselves of one of those emotional interviews with the mother of two hostages. Here is Renana Jacob recounting the last call she had with her son, Yegel, uh, who was taken with his 16-year-old brother, Or. The last thing I heard was my 12-year-old, Yegel begging, saying, don't take me, I'm too young. You can't take me, I'm too young. He was repeating it a couple of times and then the phone hung up and the line went off. And that was the last time I heard of them. 
Um, as the chairman said, we heard nothing since. We don't know anything of their whereabouts. We don't no, know exactly. whether they're alive. We don't know for how long, where they are, whether they're being taken care of. They're children. They're just children. I mean, extremely emotional language being used there, and, and rightly so. I mean, it's extremely devastating to hear those mothers recounting losing their children, children which have been underground now and held hostage for a month today. Um, Elon, when you listen to things like that, that must uh, distress you enormously. But why do you think it's so that the world keeps focusing mainly on the children of Palestine and seemingly not standing up for getting these hostages released? Heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, every day that I come to the defense ministry to do these interviews, I cycle past the protests of the hostages' families just outside and well up every time there are over 30 children hostage in some dark tunnel being held by armed gunmen with Kalashnikovs. There are children there who are literally orphaned because Hamas murdered their parents in front of them and took them in. Uh, now, when we look at the Gaza Strip, that is the main humanitarian question on our mind, the fate of the 240 plus hostages who have been held incommunicado for a month, for a month without any access to the Red Cross. We don't know whether families are together, have been torn apart, what they've been fed, whether the elderly have been given medication. We know that Hamas is a brutal, bloodthirsty terror organization that raped, murdered and slaughtered their family and uh, neighbors before abducting them into the Gaza Strip. And we expect the world to rightfully demand their immediate and unconditional return and absenting effective diplomatic pressure to bring them back. That's why we're going in. We're not waiting for the UN to send a fax to Hamas to ask them to give our hostages back. We're going in in order to free them and to make sure that Hamas can never hurt our people again. And uh, Can you uh, reiterate what I think is Israel's position is that there is no question of even considering a ceasefire until those hostages are released. Am I right on that? There will be no ceasefire that leaves our hostages in Gaza and Hamas in power. I mean, as we speak, my understanding is that uh, people in northern Gaza have been given four hours to evacuate, once again being told to get to safety in the south, um, talking of very small humanitarian pauses to potentially try and get aid to civilians who need medication, food. Uh, I mean, what sort of steps is Israel taking other than these measures that we've heard announced to make sure that there are as few civilian, civilian casualties as possible? Civilians in northern Gaza have actually been given three weeks to evacuate the north. It's been three weeks since Israel issued that warning for them to move south temporarily for their own safety. And most of them have done that. The last figures I saw were as of 1.1 out of 1.1 million residents in northern Gaza, only 100,000 remain. But let me tell you what Israel is doing to keep civilians safe, because it really is fair to say that the IDF has made greater efforts than any army in the history of warfare to keep people safe. First of all, three weeks notice to get out of the way. It's fair to say we've surrendered the element of surprise and put our own troops at risk. Our soldiers have made 20,000 individual phone calls to people in Gaza, telling them to move. We've dropped 1.5 million leaflets. We've given over 10 million text messages and recorded messages urging people to leave. And we've opened at least three humanitarian corridors, one of which this week was attacked by Hamas. Hamas terrorists fired mortars at the Israeli soldiers who were facilitating people moving south. Now, let me tell you what the absurdity is. In every war, the international community and UN institutions make maximal efforts to get civilians out of harm's way. That is their responsibility as an international community. And this is the only conflict that I'm aware of where Israel is being condemned by UN agencies for efforts to get the other side civilians out of harm's way so they won't face the consequences of the danger that their leaders have put them in. You know, the fighting in northern Gaza is going to get very dangerous. Just yesterday, we exposed uh, rockets inside a mosque, tunnels that literally went through people's living rooms. We've shown how the main Hamas headquarters is located underneath the Shifa hospital in Gaza. These are all war crimes, and those are all legitimate targets. And so we're asking people to get out of the way, doing more than any army in history to get them out of the way so we can go after the perpetrators who did October 7th and make sure they can never hurt our people again. Uh, Elon, uh, I, I kind of struggle to see the difference between a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire. But nevertheless, both Joe Biden and now our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak are uh, stressing there is a difference uh, and they are calling for humanitarian pauses. 
uh, in the bombing and the shelling and the fighting uh, to get uh, some victims to safety. Uh, is there any chance that uh, Israel would agree to these so-called humanitarian pauses? There will be no ceasefire. We're going to continue with our campaign to destroy Hamas in response to the so, October oh, sorry, 7th sorry, massacre. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, are, are, you, are, you then, are you then categorising uh, a humanitarian pause as a ceasefire? Because I'm damned if I can see the difference. The Prime Minister said yesterday, if we're talking about tactical pauses, an hour here, an hour there in order to let humanitarian aid in or let our hostages out, that is something we would consider in accordance with the operational circumstances at the time. But we'd be talking about minor pauses to facilitate the provision of humanitarian aid. I should add, Israel at the moment is thumping Hamas in the north of Gaza. Aid is entering the Gaza Strip through the south of Gaza, and that's where the main humanitarian zone is. There is simply no contradiction between thumping Hamas in the north, letting humanitarian aid in in the south. And in fact, we've been doing both in recent days, thumping Hamas harder and letting in more humanitarian aid through the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. Uh, Elon Levy, thank you very much for your time. Israeli government spokesman you. there. Uh, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. Uh, Lynn has texted, all hostages have to be returned. Then it's up to Israel to consider a ceasefire. Ian asks, has anyone seen the London mayor? Not a word from him regarding the planned weekend protests. And he has done absolutely nothing to allay the fears of the Jewish community in the capital. Disgraceful. But uh, Sarah says, everyone should be able to express their opinions regardless of how ridiculous they may, might sound to the opposite side. And Cal has tweeted, the original Armistice Day exists to honour the fallen in the past. Protesters want to honour today's fallen and prevent more. They have more in common than they realise. Yeah, well, coming up after the break, the government's crime crackdown unveiled in the first King's speech in 70 years. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We're here! Good morning, everybody! Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for this? You like, I'm so rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose? No, Louis I Span. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yes. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this show. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. King Charles has been setting out Rishi Sunak's legislative agenda in the first King's speech in 70 years. Yeah, the government has pledged to put criminal justice at the heart of its plans, along with laws to prevent children smoking and legislation to support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields in the UK. Legislation will be introduced to strengthen the United Kingdom's energy security and reduce reliance on volatile international energy markets and hostile foreign regimes. This bill will support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields, helping the country to transition to net zero by 2050 without adding undue burdens on households. Well, joining us in the studio is Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, and former Metropolitan Police Detective, Peter Blexley. Peter, I'm going to start with you. Um, Cardwell, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, which Peter. way are you going yeah, here? This one. Um, I mean, listening to that, to me, it was sort of very wishy-washy. There were a lot of sort of vague headlines. Mm. We're going to do all sorts of things. We're going to sort of do this in the realm of education. We're going to be tougher on law and order. We're going to help people renting houses. But not much granular detail. Is that normal, do you think? For it a, is a fairly normal. There, there are a lot of words in this one. It's the longest since 2015. But in terms of the number of bills, a about 21. Now, the question is whether the government actually gets through those before the election. There's a lot to happen between now and then, including an autumn statement and a spring budget. So there's a lot to go. Also, is it in May or is it in October in terms of the election? In terms of what they want to do, yes, certainly big focus on law and order. There's a lot within that, I think. But these were just the headlines from King Charles today. It was never going to go into a huge amount of detail. There'll be a big debate in Parliament over the next couple of days as well. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of these bills being presented and we'll see where they go. But interesting today, lots in it, but a few things not in it as well. Um, LGBT conversion therapy, for example, that, that ban is not in there. Also, uh, uh, legislation which would allow central government to ban local government councils from putting in low traffic neighbourhoods. That's nowhere to be seen either. So it's interesting what's there and also what's not there. Would you see it as a sort of political statement because this is the King's speech that effectively will sort of usher Rishi towards the next election? So what is he trying to say with this King's speech? Uh, who is he trying to appeal to? Because as Alex said, it seems rather sort of nebulous and wishy-washy. Yeah, I mean, Rishi Sunak keeps talking about uh, the longer-term interests of the country, that he's making tough decisions, whether it's... <laughs> What's on he economy. care about the longer term? He won't be there. <laughs> well, he, want, he wants people to think he will, though, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. is part of it. But Good luck with that, yeah. Rishi. But criminal justice, for example, it's a very interesting one because the mm. Conservatives know yeah. they can kind of win on that, although Labour have been doing better in the uh, polls recently. Uh, yeah, Peter... Which Peter? Blackley. Which Peter? <laughs> <laughs> on that, there was a huge focus on law and order. I, I don't know if this is necessarily in response to some of the sort of more horrible news we've had recently. Uh, part of that is making sure that offenders turn up for their sentencing. Of course, the murderer of Zara Alina did not do that. Lucy Letby did not do that. Also talking about far tougher sentences and saying that those who commit the most heinous acts, particularly sex crimes that have been premeditated, are going to be there for life. But my concern is we've got the highest prison population since 2011, about 500 prison spaces left. And it seems to me what's been happening is completely the opposite direction of that. People being released early to free up space in prisons. Yes, although Alex Chalk MP, the uh, the Lord Chancellor was on the television this morning saying we've got a, a plan which is going to break all records in terms of building new prison spaces. They said that in 2019 as well. <laughs> Indeed, they did. So we will have to see. I think your scepticism is very well placed and it's fine locking people up, but you've got to have cells in which to put them. And talking of cells, taking people out of cells to put them in front of courts to hear their sentencing if the judge decrees it necessary... 
uh, they've said that reasonable force will be allowed. So we can say reasonable or proportionate. Well, I've got my crystal ball out and I've got some very bad news coming down the line because if this gets onto the statute book and some of the worst, most sadistic murderers are forced from their cells into the court to hear their sentencing, I'm afraid we can guarantee that one of them will sue the authorities for injuries caused whilst forcing them into the court and we'll have to see how that kind of a court case will will pan out, unfortunately. No, I like to do is that whoever does that, whoever sues the government because they got injured because they wouldn't face their sentences, to say, "Oh look, uh, here, here's your lawsuit." Yeah. 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 Now sit down and do your sentence. Now. Also, uh, if, it, if they do turn up to the court case about the previous court case, will they turn up for the verdict? Exactly you right. Know, exactly just keep going. right. Uh, I haven't got a running order for the rest of the show. <laughs> just well, because of that, on, that dramatic theatrical <laughs> gesture, I will now be rendered impotent for the rest of the show. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, Peter, Peter Blexi, uh, the, 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 the uh, full life sentences that they're talking about, uh, expanding the number of offences that uh, will warrant uh, being put into a cell and uh, them throwing away the key for the rest of your life, they're expanding that number. I mean... I mean, I'm not against that. I think there should be more... If you're going to have full life sentences, some of the people who don't get full life sentences, I think, well, you know, if that doesn't get a full life sentence, what the hell does? And I think we ought to think about full life sentences for crimes that aren't just murder. There should be other crimes that warrant those sentences at all. But in the great scheme of things, uh, Peter, uh, in the criminal... Uh, echelons. I mean, are, does it, would it make any difference? I mean, will we get less murders if there are more full life sentences uh, in the air? No, I don't think we will, but I think it gives the public some sense of satisfaction. By the same token, that if we brought back hanging, you wouldn't get less murders. It's been shown time and time again in many different jurisdictions yeah. that capital punishment is not a deterrent for those who want to kill others. But it's very interesting that this proposal in the King's speech comes today, just in a matter of days after Zana Alina's murderer... Jordan McSweeney. Had, Jordan McSweeney had his sentence reduced mm. from 38 years to 30. 33 yeah. years yeah. as the minimum time he'll serve, which is absolutely appalling, and so many people have been rightfully outraged by that. And that's the point, because that, 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 that's a, a real indication of the right hand not knowing what, what the left hand is doing. So the government's thinking, we've got to get tougher, there's got to be more of these uh, full-life sentences. Meanwhile, the authorities are busy uh, being lenient with a monster like Jordan McSweeney, not getting the memo. Yeah, absolutely. And it perfectly fitted that sadistic element yeah. that Alex yeah. Short was talking about. Yes, and that's yeah. going to change gonna in, gonna the legislation. Come in this legislation. He could not yeah. have been more sadistic. If there's a sadistic or, or a sexual element to murder, that will per, uh, perhaps lead to a whole life tariff. The interesting thing, actually, is that there are about 80,000 people in prison in this country. Only 67 of them currently have whole life tariffs. Right. So this could change things quite a lot in terms of what prison it does, what's it for, and crucially, how much it costs to lock people up for 50, 60 years. Yeah, I mean, Cardi, picking up on something that you said earlier, that the focus in, it seems to be Sunak's mantra at the moment, which is long-term decisions. And he's talking about these in the shape of building the NHS workforce, um, investment into uh, towns and cities, uh, whether it be about uh, tougher sentences, climate change, hitting targets, North Sea oil. But how many of these are likely to make uh, in the rest of the 10 that we know he's got, or not, how many would just be reversed with a change in government? Well, not a huge uh, number, and it's interesting as well. There could hypothetically be another King's speech before the next election. In theory, we, the Parliament can go on until January 2025. I don't think it will, but there could be another King's speech. But uh, the thought of getting through 21 pieces of legislation mm. at least is an awful lot within that time period, especially when you have all these other big set piece events and. Uh, recesses and all the rest of it. So it's very ambitious, I think. I mean, it's it's we're saying it's not that, that inspiring. A lot of this has been pre-announced and so on. But there is quite a lot to get through. And actually, Rishi Sunak's uh, parliamentary procedure and timings have been criticised on numerous occasions for not having kind of enough for MPs to do enough legislation. But there are things, as Peter mentions there as well, in terms of uh, legislation that actually exists at the moment. There is, you can't be done for contempt of court if you don't come up, for example, to hear your sentence being read out. But codifying that into another law, some people say actually another law is needed to just implement the law that's there already, and that is the
the case. I mean, certainly in the Zara Alina case as well, there are, there are various arguments around that. So it'll be really interesting to see how this goes. Certainly on the criminal justice element, there's a lot of Labour basically agreeing with the government on a lot of that. So if Rishi Sunak wants to put clear blue water electorally, that'll be quite difficult. Would you think he's picked some of these for that reason, that they can be done, so he yes. can tick them off and list them then at the dispatch box and say these are the things the government has managed to achieve? Yes, I think he can, especially because his five pledges, which we'll evaluate on the 4th of January, are all uh, going sort of all right <laughs> but not really. Okay. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, we're going to the stop boats. the boats while we've got rid of a fifth of them, yeah, for example. Yeah, inflation. So, yeah, so we, we'll see what happens with those, and then I think it's in the tricky territory. The big gamble politically is that the economy shifts, that uh, we get inflation wow. down, yeah. debt down, borrowing down. Which would be and, very little to do with the government, yeah. frankly. Well, yeah. indeed. <laughs> and they do have this little bit of fiscal headroom, this £13 billion, pounds, which in the scheme of things sounds like a lot, but isn't really. And what Jeremy Hunt does with that in the autumn statement later this month, which I think will be at least as significant as the King's speech today. I think it should be a, a clause in the speech, something like, but my government uh, will get uh, police commissioners to arrest criminals and <laughs> radical investigate idea. crimes. Yeah. Radical idea. Radical idea. That's a bit... That'll never take off. Yeah, will yeah. never take Sadly, off. Sadly, many of them won't know how to do that. Because <laughs> oh. they've never done it. <laughs> well, that was a very positive and uplifting interview. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Both. <laughs> Thank you for two Peters. <laughs> well, we have your texts and tweets. Reacting to the King's speech, Sean says... That speech was a joke. I fell asleep. What a bore. You and me both. You know, honestly, I was listening to it in the canteen and my He's eyes no were closing. He's very man, is he, old King Charles? I know. <laughs> Wayne's tweeted, nothing changes. The speech is a waste of time and money. Mix texted, you can't get tough on crime with a weak, wimp police service controlled by diversity officers. I think uh, Peter Blexley would agree with that one. I would agree with that as well. <laughs> now, coming up after the break, Just Stop Oil has denied targeting the Cenotaph during their protest protests on Monday after receiving backlash from a number of MPs. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, eco-activist group Just Stop Oil has received a backlash from a number of MPs after being accused of targeting the Cenotaph during their protests on Monday. In a now-deleted tweet, Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper called for action totally unacceptable and praised police for their swift response. But Just Stop Oil has denied targeting the War Memorial, uh, tweeting, that's a lie. They were marching towards Parliament Square before being arrested by police for protesting. Nothing to do with the Cenotaph. Uh, this comes as two Just Stop Oil members also smashed the glass cover of a painting at the National Gallery on Monday afternoon. Yeah, well, joining us in the studio now is spokesperson for Just Stop Oil, Dr Patrick Hart. Patrick, before we get into the politics, of uh, what, you're, what, what you advocate as an activist organisation, do you not think that you're not really doing much to enamour people to your cause with what are, frankly, puerile actions, actions of criminal damage, things that look deeply disrespectful and, in other instances, outright dangerous when you're slow walking in the middle of highways, potentially preventing emergency service vehicles from getting through? Well, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So, first of all, uh, the comment disrespect... I was there yesterday, I saw exactly what happened. Uh, Just Up Oil supporters were nowhere near the Cenotaph. They were taken there by the police after being arrested. Um, that is, I'm afraid to say, pure fear-mongering. Um, I think there's a, a real attempt being made to make us sound like scary people, when in fact we are just ordinary people. I myself, I'm a doctor, I'm a GP. When I'm not being a supporter of Just Up Oil, I'm at work. Treating, so as a treating doctor, patients, you must treating be concerned kids. when emergency service vehicles can't take yeah. people to hospitals or to A&E because your yeah. protesters are doing slow walks. So that's fear-mongering number two. So there has never been a complaint from the ambulance service about Just a Paul. We submitted a fire freedom, a freedom of information request to the ambulance service. The fire service and, complained, though. OK, let me deal with the question I've got. We submitted a freedom of information request to to the ambulance service and they said, no, we've never been a problem at all. So again, I think there's a real attempt to smear people here because I think there's nothing else you've got on us, okay? What we are doing is we are ordinary people standing up for our values, okay? We're going out on the streets and saying enough is enough. The British people do not want new oil and gas in every poll. I do. In I do. <laughs> right, well, you're in the minority. So you're just assuming. I'm, no, no, I'm, you're no, assuming that. No, no, that, that that's no, no, a ridiculous no, no. thing to no say. No assumptions. That's a ridiculous no thing assumptions. to say. No assumptions. I'm a doctor. I've been trained scientifically well, to nothing deal... nothing to do with whether deal, or not the majority of no, no, no. Uh, people in Britain I've, want I've been gas trained and oil. To deal, they do. It's cheap. I've been trained to deal with the facts. OK, there's another untruth there. I've been trained to deal with the facts, OK? Well, tell what is the facts? How the, many? The How many? You the, say the majority. How yeah. many? What's the percentage? So if you ask... And what do you base If you ask the British people, do you want to see more drilling in the North Sea, mm -hmm. the number one answer is no. Thanks very much. How's that campaign no. going for you? Well, it's going great because the most British people don't want to see more no, drilling no, in the North Sea. The government has just announced in the King's speech yeah. rolling contracts for more drilling so this, for North Sea oil and gas. This is so a, how's your campaign going to stop This that? is a great point. So not why going would, at all why, well, is it? Why, why, why do you bother with these so, demonstrations? Because so, you're getting nowhere, are so you? Why all would, you've achieved, all you've achieved, Alex, in, in a couple of years... My name's Patrick. Patrick. Sorry, Patrick. 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 I'm sorry, Patrick. I don't call <laughs> Alex. Love Alex. I do. Yeah. Yeah, she's I Alex. I've achieved a lot. Thank I'm you very so much. Worked up. And, no, seriously, and you're, you're all, you've achieved, all, you've, all you've achieved, uh, Patrick, is a U-turn in the government's approach to green policies. That was announced about a month ago. Now they've just announced rolling contracts for mm. North Sea gas and oil drilling. So all yeah. of your demonstrations have been completely ineffective, haven't so, they? So why are they making Well, answer the question, yes or no? I'm answering it. Yeah, okay. Why, why, <laughs> not. why are they... Well, I'm answering it. OK. It's not a yes or no answer. Yeah. This is the answer. Why are they doing it? It's because they know that we are winning, OK? They know that just a boiler being winning? effective. They're so scared that their friends, the, the oil barons who are their friends, are going to be out of a job soon, that they are having to put in place laws to guarantee business for these people so in the future. So your demonstration has resulted in, they, in continued decline in polluting... Policies. This old, dirty, polluting industry is on its last let's, legs. Let, let, and let's, they know that. Let's get and they're dream. clinging on to everything they've in got. Let, let's get back to something quite serious here, because, mm. you know, I think it's a relatively infantile argument to suggest the government are doing this to help their friends, the oil barons in the industry. It's, it's not infantile. Uh, 
the government themselves true. said in the King's Sorry. speech that they want to use profits from oil for energy security, first of all, for geopolitical security. We had to buy gas from Qatar over the winter so Mrs. Miggins didn't freeze to death in her home, something I think as a GP you'd be concerned about. We Very know that 88% of the world's power is from fossil fuel and actually cutting off fossil fuels altogether in the UK would actually massively increase poverty. It would massively affect food supply chains. We would massively affect the production of medicines, for instance. It's just not feasible. To say this is about punishing oil barons is infantile. And the people who would carry the can for what you advocate are the most vulnerable in our society. I've got to pick up on the point you said about medicines, OK? I am here because I want to be able to do my job as a doctor, OK? My number one priority is my patients. And what will destroy our healthcare system, what will mean that ordinary people cannot get medicines, is climate breakdown, mm -hmm. okay? That, that is the number one health threat facing humanity. Okay. Not my words, that is the words of the world's doctors. We are all agreed on this. I don't think the world's the doctors are all agreed. You can't make sweeping statements like the world's so doctors are all agreed. If, just every oil. representative body Patrick, of doctors. you are getting nowhere. You, you guys are getting nowhere. All you have achieved is a reversal of green policies by the government. If you carry on, you should manage to get rid of the carbon net zero by 2050 pledge as well, because every time you have a demonstration, your cause goes backwards. You're not achieving anything you're actually achieving the reverse of what you want to achieve so well you look at it look at the situation now we've just announced continued drilling in the North Sea for gas and oil ad infinitum for as long as we can imagine so it's mm. not working your campaign it's I a, respect your a, convictions a, so but your campaign is not working well thank you it's a real act of desperation that isn't it but I guess when well, to you respect call it, your convictions no to carry on drilling in the North Sea Putting no, in it's legislation. Just, it's not. It's so, to provide. So, when you say my cause, there's a real problem with that. It's not my cause. It's all of our cause. Okay. Well, okay. All we right. Talk Patrick, no, we're no, going to no, have no. to regroup no, no. another we time. We are talking we're, about we are out of time. And we're going to have to regroup. Join Just Up Oil. Go to Just Up Oil. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely oil. join Just Up Oil. Just That's going to happen. Org. We're out of time. We're generally out of time. We've got, time. got a deal. We've got a deal. Woo, there we go. Well, that Thank puts some more hot air into the atmosphere. Coming up after the break, three Israeli mothers have told Talk TV in an exclusive interview of their anguish as their children remain hostages of Hamas. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. We're here! Good morning, everybody! Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah! <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You're like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yes. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this show. <laughs> Kevin, right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs>
We've got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. We have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to our brand new show, Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up in the next hour, a parent's pain. The mothers of hostages being held in Gaza tell Talk TV of their anguish after their children were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists a month ago today. Meanwhile, Israel's president has told us that protests planned for Armistice Day must be banned. And crime and punishment form the center of the first King's speech in 70 years today as the government promises to get tough on crime, lengthen jail sentences and give more powers to the police. And Operation Earthshot. Uh, while his younger brother, Prince Harry, takes private jets to Las Vegas concerts, Prince William hosts his Eco Prize in Singapore. Yeah, all of that's coming up in the next hour, particularly the harrowing exclusive interviews we have with the three mothers whose children were kidnapped by Hamas last month. And I think it's very important that we're doing this as a channel. We've seen the Sun newspaper reminding everybody of all of the children, some of them babies, snatched out of their beds, taken away from their parents and now kept underground by militia, essentially terrorists armed with Kalashnikovs in these dark, cramped spaces, meters and meters and meters below the ground as shelling happens on the surface. And how cruel and frankly, how evil that is. And the reason why, of course, we're seeing the bombardment of Gaza today. Yeah, Very important, we that, keep it uh, in mind. Do you remember that father, I think it was about three weeks ago now, maybe two, uh, who found out that uh, his kid, his little daughter, was seven years old, who was kidnapped. Mm. She, he found out that uh, she'd been killed. And he celebrated that. He said because being killed, yeah. uh, he was really thrilled that his daughter had been killed because uh, being killed yeah. is, wor is uh, much better than being kept in those tunnels. So that uh, is a window into the sheer anguish mm. and anxiety that those poor mothers are feeling. And don't forget, they're just three of them. Yeah. There are quite a few kids down in those tunnels. Uh, little babies, 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 for God's sake. I mean, I think it's so important that we keep a focus on this. So much clamour is being made for just having a ceasefire, you know, let's protect all of the civilians in uh, Palestine. But we heard earlier from uh, the Israeli government spokesperson saying we are doing more than we have ever done before, more than any country has ever done to try and protect civilians. Three weeks to move to a different part of the country, um, giving early warning systems via text messages. And at the same time, nothing is happening about those hostages being released. And this is what started this entire atrocity. And it, I think it's really important as well to remember that when people are going on these marches calling for a ceasefire, a ceasefire that Hamas themselves would refuse yeah. to take part in, that they are in many respects marching for the terrorist organizations who want to see Israel wiped off the face of the earth. The head of Hezbollah uh, saying in a speech the other day that thank you, thank you activists marching in the Western world because you're standing up for our cause. UK intelligence now saying that at least half of the organizations who are coordinating these marches have direct yeah. links 
to Hamas. Yeah, they're wasting Hamas. their time anyway because there isn't going to be a ceasefire. So uh, call for one all you like. It's not going to happen. Uh, we'll also be doing a royal roundup because apart from delivering the King's speech, uh, today Charles is uh, facing all sorts of problems. Uh, we're trying to work out whether Harry and Meghan have snubbed his 75th birthday party next week in Balmoral or whether or not uh, uh, they were invited in the first place. So that's all very interesting. Plus, there's a bombshell book out by, what do you call him, Omid Scobie? Ovid Scabies. Ovid Scabies. Ovid Scabies. Yeah, he likes uh, writing epic tales of yeah, pure so fiction, doesn't he, he? He's written a new book called Endgame, uh, which once again accused the, the royal family of being uh, racist and bigoted. Oh, so, Kelsey, uh, that man would find intersectionality everywhere, wouldn't uh, he? Also, Donald Trump has been in court again, so we'll be mm. uh, catching up with the former president's latest legal problems as they unfold over there in Manhattan. Meanwhile, we'd love to hear from you too. So text us, uh, write talk in your message and send it to 87222 or tweet us on x at Talk TV. Uh, but first, let's get the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. Well, in a Talk TV exclusive, three Israeli mothers have been describing their moment their children were kidnapped by Hamas. They are in the UK to raise awareness a month to the day since the terror group crossed into Israel to commit atrocities. The women have lost five children to Hamas and have also seen other family members murdered. This violence all over the world now is just... is so sad. It's so sad that humans prefer to choose war and violence over living a normal, peaceful life. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't relate to it. King Charles has delivered the first King's speech for 70 years at the state opening of Parliament. He began by paying tribute to his darling mother and then went on to list the government's current priorities, among them crime, a smoke-free generation and the economy. The impact of COVID and the war in Ukraine have created significant long-term challenges for the United Kingdom. That is why my government's priority is to make the difficult but necessary long-term decisions to change this country for the better. My minister's focus is on increasing economic growth and safeguarding the health and security of the British people for generations to come. House prices rose in October for the first time in six months. Prices rose by 1.1% last month. Halifax says it was due to a lack of homes for sale, but they expect values to fall over the next year. Almost 300,000 women in England are going to be offered a drug that could prevent breast cancer. Recent trials showed the medication can reduce the chances of developing the disease by almost 50% over 11 years. Around 47,000 women in England are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. Amazon workers are going to go on strike in a long-running dispute over pay. Members of the GMB union are expected to walk out for three days and on Black Friday, one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Around 1,000 workers will walk out after criticising a pay offer it said was worth £1 an hour. The Prince of Wales has met the finalists ahead of his Earthshot Awards. Tonight, William will give out five £1 million prizes at the ceremony in Singapore to those with the best ideas to help tackle the world's biggest environmental threats. Two of the finalists are from the UK. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at the weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the weather's going to stay unsettled, dominated as it is by yet another area of low pressure. And this one is likely to bring some cloud, rain and strong winds tonight. But certainly at the moment, it's mostly showery across the country. And even those showers are tending to transfer eastwards and die out from the west. So for the rest of the afternoon, sunny spells, scattered showers. It's not that warm. Temperatures only around 9 or 10 degrees Celsius in the north, around 12 to 13 in the south. And then as we go into this evening, it's all change. 
Clear skies early on will lead to a touch of frost over the northeast of Scotland. Could be some mist and fog there as well. A few showers precede this rain area, which makes its way across Ireland in the early hours and then makes its way into western parts of the UK mainland. Now, on the back edge of this uh, rain belt, you could find some really squally rain and strong winds. In fact, the winds will pick up, could touch gale force at times. So the lowest temperatures overnight occur early in the night and then they start to recover after that as the cloud and the rain moves in. So through Wednesday morning, wet and windy weather across the UK mainland, clearing only slowly from parts of East Anglia and the southeast. And you can see it's going to be quite chilly with temperatures only around 8 to 13 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips now to our top story and three of the mothers of kidnapped hostages being held by Hamas since the 7th of October attacks a month ago have told Talk TV in an exclusive interview of their anguish. Hadass Calderon, Renana Jacob and Batsheva Yahalomi have nine members of their families taken by the terrorists. Batsheva, whose husband Ohad, along with their eldest son Aitan, is still missing, described the moment her 12-year-old was taken. This was uh, the last moment I saw Aitan, my son. His motorcycle continued to Gaza. Me and my two daughters, we managed to escape through the fields. So we went three and a half hours with pyjamas, no shoes, no telephones. They took the, the phones. We don't know anything about Ohad and about Eitan, my son. I know Eitan is alone. He's only 12. No child should be alone without his mother. Holding back tears, Renana, who wasn't at home at the time of the attack, recounts the last phone call she had with her son, Yegel, who was taken with his 16-year-old brother, Orr. The last thing I heard was my 12-year-old, Yegel, begging, saying, don't take me, I'm too young. You can't take me, I'm too young. He was repeating it a couple of times, and then the phone hung up and the line went off. And that was the last time I heard of them. Um, as the chapter said, we heard nothing since. We don't know anything of their whereabouts. We don't no know sight. whether they're alive. We don't know for how long. Where they are, whether they're being taken care of. They're children. They're just children. And Hadas Calderon's son and daughter Erez and Saha are also still missing, along with three other family members taken from their kibbutz last month. I want you to imagine, any mom in the world, to imagine, for one minute, your child, your young little boy or girl, being kidnapped suddenly with, from their safe house with pyjama from, pyjama from their bed. No shoes, no nothing. Just kidnapped like that. Cruelly way, merciless way, cruelly way been holding like that when they helpless terrified confused joining us now from israel is mayan sherman uh, mother of ron a 19 year old idf soldier who has also been kidnapped by hamas uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, you must seriously empathize with those poor mothers uh, whose young <laughs> children have been kidnapped. Uh, bad enough for you, of course, uh, but there's, you know, you're talking about virtual babies there. I mean, this, this sounds like a crass question, but try to sum up what it's like uh, to be you now, knowing that your son is held captive by these awful monsters from Hamas somewhere beneath Gaza in one of these hellhole tunnels. Uh, what is life like for you? You know, it's not, uh, I wouldn't call it life because, you know, it's uh, one month now and we, we don't leave, we don't eat, we don't sleep, we, we, we cannot do anything, just, you know, the, the thoughts are, uh, you know, are hunting us every minute of the day. And My what... son uh, is 19 and uh, he was, uh, you know, I'm the luckiest of all of them because I have seen him in this video that the Hamas released 
just five hours, uh, he was kidnapped. So I know he was kidnapped alive. And this keeps me, you know, I, I still have hope that he's still alive. And so I see myself as the luckiest of them all because I don't think that uh, there were many uh, videos that Hamas released of uh, of their hostages. Uh, and my son was uh, texting me. And during the time he was kidnapped, uh, he told me that he was uh, he was being kidnapped. Actually, I didn't know if he was killed at the end of the of the of the texting or uh, or uh, being uh, kidnapped. But he told me that the terrorists around, and uh, he was uh, he was very afraid. And uh, he told us. Him. Uh, but when we saw this uh, video after four or five hours, we, we, we felt, it's crazy to say, but we felt a relief because we knew that he was, uh, he was uh, taken alive and uninjured, as you can see in this film. Uh, but, uh, that, you know, it's, it's the worst of your nightmares as a mother or as a parent, you know, I, I, I think that you, can, you, you, you cannot even imagine what we are going through. Just think about it. Yeah. As uh, that's what the one said, just try to think about this scenario. It's it's the worst of all scenarios for us, really. Yeah, I mean it's completely unimaginable. Uh, tell us about your son Ron and, and and what you know of the events leading up to his capture. Do you know where he was? Do you know what he was doing? Yeah, he was uh, sleeping, and uh, he was in uh, uh, near kibbutz. Um, and the Tiva Asara, which is on the border with the Gaza Strip. Uh, he was, uh, he heard, it, he, he called us the missile at, uh, attack on the, on, uh, you know, uh, he, they didn't know what, what it was because we are used to missile attacks in the south of Israel. And uh, this is what they thought it was. And they ran to uh, Migunit, it's a shelter. Uh, it's, it's not exactly a shelter. It's Uh, and they went in there, and after a while, he was texting me all the time until he said, Mom, I have, there are terrorists all around us. I didn't believe him. He asked me what to do. Uh, you know, and he is 19. I know him as a very self-confident young man, and suddenly he became a little boy, really, and it haunts me because I know that uh, he needed to ask for my help, and I couldn't, I couldn't help him. I didn't know what to say. Uh, I didn't believe him actually at the, you know, when he, he, when he said it, I, I said, it's no, Ron, come on, I watch TV, it wasn't on TV, it wasn't anywhere on the news. I said, no, it's, you know, it's your imagination, forget about it, just calm down. Uh, and uh, after, you know, maybe five or six minutes, I understood I made a mistake because uh, he uh, said goodbye. I hear Arabic language outside the shelter. And, um, and uh, you know, he stopped texting us, I love you all, and that's over, it's over, and that's what, all he wrote. And afterwards, there was silence. And, uh, uh, you know, just think about this, you know, this uh, moment uh, for him. As a mother, I, I was, you know, I was in a shock. I really think that it was, it was a kind of a shock because I understood that uh, terrorists, took over my son. I didn't know what they did with him until I saw this video. Um, but as I told you, uh, when this video was released by the Hamas, I was relieved because I knew that he was captured alive. And I I really hope, I have the hope to see him again. Um, Mayan, uh, and Mayan uh, the, the, the Prime Minister Netanyahu says that Israel has two missions. One is to destroy Hamas. And the other is, of course, to emancipate, to free the hostages. Uh, do you have faith that he will achieve that? Do you have faith that the hostages will be released? It depends when you ask me this question during the day. You know, I can tell you now that I really feel that it's going to happen. And if you ask me this tomorrow morning, maybe I'll tell you uh, another answer. It depends, you know, uh, you know, we don't know what to think because we really, we really don't know what's going, what they're doing. We don't know anything. They don't share anything. We don't know what's going on with the negotiation, uh, you know, in Qatar and in uh, Egypt. And, you know, every expert says something else. And uh, 
Uh, I, you know, we have trust in our uh, government now, well, really in, in, uh, in the IDF. We know that they will do anything in the world to bring them back. And um, we really hope that uh, things are being done, but you know, they don't share it with us. So it depends when you ask me this question. Uh, right now, I can tell you that, you know, yeah, it may, they, may be, they may bring them back, uh, but I, really, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not sure. And, you know, think about it. It's like, you know, you gamble on your son's life. It's crazy, but it's it's like it's, it's exactly like this. I feel like, you know, sometimes I feel like 50 percent of I, I would see him alive. And sometimes I see I think maybe 80 uh, percent chances I will see him alive. And it depends on the on the hour of the day. Ryan, I really can't imagine what you're going through. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the programme. Such Maya. composure and such strength. It must, and, and, and how important it is to remind us in the Western world of what you are going through. Mothers in Israel, brothers, sisters, fathers, uncles, friends and neighbours who have witnessed some of the most appalling atrocities and have been missing family members now for a month. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, Maya, actually, one last question. Uh, back here in Britain, uh, and indeed around the Western world, I don't know if you've been following events, but we've been having these massive pro-Palestinian marches uh, snaking through our big cities, especially London. Uh, the sentiment is extremely uh, anti-Israel. It's rather anti-British as well, even though these marches are, for the most part, British. Uh, I wonder what you felt about their proposal to march on Saturday, Armistice Day, because uh, we have our Remembrance Weekend this weekend, of course. Saturday, a very sacred day, uh, and they're planning to march uh, pro-Palestine. Uh, and uh, a lot of people uh, who want to honour our fallen, our dead, uh, feel that this is inappropriate. Uh, and that perhaps they're showing far too much support for Palestine when it's Israel who suffered. It's Israel's fault. I wonder what you felt about these pro-Palestinian marches, hundreds of thousands of them marching through our cities every weekend? I think that, you, you, first of all, you have... I, I don't think that they, they know exactly what happened here. I really believe that these people, you know, it's not exa against only against Israelis. It's against humanity, what happened here. Have you seen, uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the Hamas terrorists filmed themselves what they have done in the kibbutz around Gaza? They filmed it. And, uh, you know, people who watched these films cannot stay, you know, everybody is, you know, it's, it's, it's the most horrible uh, uh, things that you can imagine. Uh, I don't think that even the ISIS did such terrible things to little children. And I don't want to say exactly what has been done. But if you are a human being, and it doesn't matter if you're an Arab, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jewish, if you're a Christian, just look at these video. If you have, you know, if you have the strength to look at it, and then I want you to to, to go and protest for Palestine, for free Palestine. And uh, again, we don't have anything against the, the Palestinian people, and it's very important for you to know we have a lot against the Hamas terrorist organization, and it's not the same. It's not the same. I'm, I'm not sure that people understand that, you know, the Hamas is much worse than ISIS, much worse. They, they have done things that you cannot imagine uh, that they have done to, to, to people, to little children, to families, to women, and they filmed everything themselves. So you can look for it and you can see it online if you want to. And afterwards, let's see if you can protest against uh, Israel. Yeah, strong words indeed. Well, look, thank you so much, Maya and Shem, for joining us today. I really cannot imagine what you were going through. Um, thank you. You can hear from those mothers throughout the afternoon on Talk Radio and Talk TV. To see the whole emotional and heart-wrenching interview, tune into Primetime with Rosanna Lockwood at 7. Now, Chloe has texted in reaction to this. She says, thank you for highlighting the plight of kidnapped children. No reasonable person wants to see any child die on either side, but it mustn't be forgotten that Hamas started this war by breaking the existing ceasefire. And Lucy says, please tell this brave, brave Israeli mother that I'm imagining her suffering and praying for her and her boy and the other families trapped in this hell. 
Coming up after the break, the government unveils its crime crackdown in the first King's speech in 70 years. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, King Charles has been setting out Rishi Sunak's legislative agenda in the first King's speech in 70 years. The government has pledged to put criminal justice at the heart of its plans, toughening up sentences for the most violent offenders, along with laws to prevent children smoking and legislation to support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields in the UK. Legislation will be introduced to strengthen the United Kingdom's energy security and reduce reliance on volatile international energy markets and hostile foreign regimes. This bill will support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields, helping the country to transition to net zero by 2050 without adding undue burdens on households. Uh, joining us now uh, is John Rental, chief political commentator for The Independent. Well, John, uh, the King Charles there adding some real razzle-dazzle to an already boring <laughs> speech. Uh, I mean, what, he was... 
try to... I mean, it was. A, he's not very good at these speeches, but then again, perhaps he deliberately plays down his own role. But uh, certainly he makes uh, pretty dull stuff even more boring. Uh, but uh, in terms of this speech for Rishi Sunak, what, what's the political aim here? We heard the, uh, you know, the classic Tory law and order crackdown, tougher sentencing and all that. Uh, then we heard uh, more contracts for North Sea oil and gas drilling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, plus the, the weird sort of kid stopping kids smoking, all of this. What, what's, su summing up, what, what's he aiming at here? Where's the vote winning uh, elements to this? Well, that's a very good question. And you're absolutely right that you know, he did he did sound incredibly bored. And I think that was because, as, as you suggested, he was trying not to uh, express any uh, personal um, views. So he read it out in a dull monotone all the way through, all, all the way through even though that bit about uh, net zero is something you might express, expect him to have a strong opinion on. Uh, but that, I mean, there, there's never a theme in 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 kings or queens speeches actually it's it's just a rag bag of uh, uh, of legislation the only the only theme ever pulling it together is, is trying to win the next election um and you know that's a that's a very difficult task i mean clearly rishi sunak thinks that a pragmatic approach to net zero uh, is a, is a vote winner we'll see whether that uh, works um, and then, as you, you're right, it's got stuff like the the anti-smoking, a smoke-free generation, he called it, or, or sorry, the king called it, um, which I suspect is um, possibly uh, with a view to having something to say at the COVID inquiry when the prime minister gives evidence to it uh, next month, um, because he will want to say how concerned he is about the nation's health. I mean, it strikes me if this was Rishi Sunak's attempts to lay out his agenda to attract votes and curry public support ahead of a general election potentially next year, um, it doesn't seem to include anything that MPs must be hearing on the doorsteps, not least of all those five key pledges, which were sort of the clarion call, really, of what <laughs> this government, what his leadership was supposed to be yeah. all about, stopping boats, halving inflation. Well, he did start with inflation, the king, to be to be fair. But that was the only one that he did mention. He didn't mention uh, the NHS, didn't mention the boats. Um, and, yeah, I mean, they mentioned the economy in, in, in general terms. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there was nothing in there that was a real sort of um, soapbox-style electoral pitch. Uh, he didn't say, let's build houses, which would, uh, which would appeal to, to some, some voters. Uh, and he didn't have much to say about about inflation and the cost of living either. And that's uh, that, that's a real gap and that's a real problem. Uh, John, a final question. Uh, short answer, please, because we need to move on. Uh, I think there were <laughs> 21 pieces of proposed legislation in this speech. Realistically, how many of them stand a chance of becoming law? More poss possibly half. I mean, I, I spoke to a Tory MP afterwards who said that, you know, there isn't enough in there to keep uh, to keep the House of Commons occupied until Christmas, um, and that if <laughs> Keir Starmer, who's about to speak, uh, accuses them of being a zombie government, they'll uh, Rishi Sunak will have nothing to say in reply to that. Interesting, interesting. Uh, well, uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, let's bring in Rupert Bell, Talk TV's royal correspondent, for his opinion on that speech. Welcome, Rupert. Uh, as I say, uh, to be fair to the king, I think he deliberately plays down his own personality to deliver this in a monotone way, but uh, his future as a uh, song and dance man, I think, is in doubt. Uh, well, that's a bit harsh, because he definitely liked and used to be a bit of a song and dance man. He was a great fan of the goons, so, uh, but there was no... No, suddenly he wanted to read it as if he was um, Ned Seagoon or, or uh, Moriarty from The Goon Show. So uh, I'm sure... Uh, that, would, that would be good, yeah, actually. Well, I'll like tell that. you what, it would have livened it up because it was... That's the point. He's basically reading, you know, a, a shopping list from the government and it's not flowery. It's got to be delivered monotone. Um, and you could see the way they were dealing with the environmental issues that we know he's interested in, it would sort of be one minute he's saying, well, we're going to do the oil and the, and the gas, yeah. and then the next sentence it says, but we're going to work hard at making sure that we net zero still is very much on the agenda. So you could see how they were trying to 
keep the king happy because uh, with, with, with elements of that that speech. But um, overall, it, it wasn't a laughathon. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I entertained myself earlier of watching all of the pomp and ceremony mm. because I genuinely That's do fun, yeah. like it. I, I love it. But what struck me is, you know, this is a king who's really trying to modernise the royal family. Um, I, I heard of one little change, which is Camilla has decided she doesn't want to call ladies-in-waiting ladies-in-waiting. They are now companions. Are there other tweaks that uh, changer, King Charles... Is absolute game changer. Game changer. Gonna, that's it, you know. It changed my entire attitude. Yeah, modern family. Yeah. But, um, no, are there <laughs> other, other <laughs> tweaks that uh, Charles made? Uh, you know, what, what sort of element of his branding and his choice was there in terms of uh, both the travelling to Parliament and how this was conducted? Yeah, well, I didn't really see any different... Well, actually, it was full state regalia in, the, in travelling then. We haven't seen much of that because it was very much pared down with the, when the Queen was coming to the end of her life because mm. it was quite hard and all the wearing that crown, which is not... which is quite a heavy piece of kit. Um, uh, oh, kit, I really shouldn't be calling it. <laughs> the state is the imperial crown, a piece of kit. Um, <laughs> it's uh, like a duffel bag. Yeah, well, it's duffel bag, it's got to change into this. Uh, but, you know, there is all that pomp and circumstance. Mm. But there were one or two little tweaks... Actually, it was the role the, the of the queen, queen. The queen and the king went through separate yeah, doors And that the was, there was definitely tweaks, but it actually shows, in my opinion, you know, how much he values the, the queen uh, at his side and, and being the sort of rock. You know, look, he's coming to his 75th birthday next week. Uh, she is a, a little bit older, but he knows he needs her. And it was also significant to see the role of the uh, uh, Princess Royal, because as the right. gold stick in, in waiting, and gold very much... Gold stick, that's it. Yeah. What a fantastic title. Well, Where does that and, come and, from? Uh, military. Gold it's stick. military protecting, and that's part of it. It's all part... Of... It's, all it's of it is... It's a stick seat. and it's gold. Yeah, <laughs> that's why it's well, called it, a gold in stick. In essence, but it's, the, it's part of a military... Yeah. Um, it would be military background towards that, but mm. it's, it shows the importance of Princess Anne in his monarchy and what part she has to play and, and the closeness of the of the two, uh, uh, the brother and sister. And, mm. and it, it is significant that she is in that. So uh, with, with all the other stuff that's going on in the royal family, you can see that Princess Anne is very much perceived as part of the really core part of, with Camilla and Anne, they are the sort of rock for him. We should ask you uh, your take. Uh, next week, it's the King's 75th birthday party right. up at Balmoral, and uh, that will uh, sort of double up as a remembrance for the Queen as well. It's a year since she died. So a very special sort of royal gathering. Uh, we're trying to sort of work out, uh, has the King not invited Harry and Meghan, or have they decided to snub his invitation? Where do you stand on that uh, one, Rupert? Uh, I think the King would probably like him there, but I'm not sure the rest of the family would. <laughs> right. I I think that's very more good of, nuance. Th that's <laughs> maybe the problem um, yeah, because yeah. they don't the lack of trust and William clearly and 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 their view that if they did turn up, where's it, which books it come, coming up to next? That they go to the when you think five. It's quite sad when you think five years ago that Meghan and Harry, when he celebrated his seventieth, they were a united family. Yeah. An yeah. awful lot has happened in that intervening yeah. time, and uh, you know, and and clearly Harry, yes. I think he might feel a bit sad. He might look as miserable uh, on the next week when he's not at the birthday party as he did at Katy Perry's concert the other day. Well, judging by some of the photographs, he didn't look to be um, enjoying every minute That's of it. that concert. He, he looks the most bored I've seen him look since he was at the Beyonce concert <laughs> with Meghan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, he, think, I don't think pop music is his thing. Well, I, well, I think it should be, but it, it, maybe he's having to now sort of think about the fallout from the private jet scenario, the, where he flew in a private jet to that, but which is, again, whereas William is out in Singapore with this mm. Earthshot Earth Prize, a big announcement tomorrow, uh, for all the prize winners, but more importantly, they all flew, including the uh, uh, Prince of Wales, by commercial flights. Yeah, right. All the prize winners and everything. They're saying, flat, yeah. we're not, but don't do anything special. Well, why, why, Rupert, uh, just before you go, why have Harry and Meghan not got the memo on this? Because <laughs> it's not as if every time they step onto a private jet, we don't all go, what are you doing on a private mm -hmm. jet? We always complain. Only recently mm. they went on their Caribbean holiday together. They're perfectly entitled to do that. Hope they had a lovely time. But did they need to fly there by private jet? No, they didn't. They certainly didn't need to fly by private jet from Santa Barbara to Las Vegas uh, to see Katy Perry. That's about a 40-minute flight. Why, why do they keep doing this? They know what will happen when they do it. Um, 
um, somehow they're just not... Re they're in that Hollywood bubble and they're not reading the room. And, yeah. they, and, and Harry needs to start really reading the room. And I think he's feeling... You know, it will be sad. If you just take the human contents, he's not at his father's 75th mm. birthday party. A big moment for him. We know he's now king. You know, you would have thought he would have loved all his family around. But unfortunately, he has created this problem. And the new book that's coming out, the Omid Scobie right. book, yeah. is it just adding more fuel to the fire anyway? Because the king is viewed as unpopular. Yes, there were a few demonstrations out there today. Uh, not my king. Mm. But overall, I think it's ambivalence. And yeah. then we've got all this other stuff that William's power hungry. Well, he's always <laughs> heir to the throne. <laughs> right. You know, I think the problem is Harry feels that he wasn't getting any share of the glory in the limelight, but he's fifth in line to the throne. I mean, Scobie mm. seems to think it's like being in a company, a mm. business, you know, and that mm. the king is chief executive and that uh, William has got his eye on the top job and he's going to try and oust him. It doesn't really go like that. <laughs> he happens to be the, the heir to the throne. Right. And mm. when his dad dies, uh, uh, praise... Please, please God, it doesn't happen for a long time. But when is that? He becomes king. Mm. That's the way it goes. Mm. Not a power that grab. It no. It's called primogeniture. But, but I think it's the family dynamics between William and Harry. It is rent asunder at the moment. Yeah. And yeah. that is the sad thing. It's very thing. sad. Very, very sad. sad because they were extremely close. That was a, you know, the Fab Four, as they called it. It had something. And probably the royal family missed them if they were a united yeah. team. The royal family would benefit. But at the moment, we spend more time discussing the splits, which is just sad. Yeah, I couldn't agree very more. Sad, very sad, very sad. Rupert, Thanks, thank you Rupert. ever so much for coming and joining us. Well, coming up after the break, if you hadn't had enough of hearing about the royals, we're going to talk more about that royal rift that has deepened, as the Sussex exclaim, they were not even invited to the King's 75th birthday bash next week. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's That's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Brave us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> 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 right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yes. King Piers and King Cube. I think <laughs> it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, the royal family's rift has resurfaced yet again this week over the forthcoming plans for the king's 75th birthday next week. After reports the Sussexes were snubbing the event, the couple have now said they've had no contact from Buckingham Palace. Yeah, the recent fallout coincides with the upcoming release of royal biographer Omid Scobie's new book, Endgame, which will include a chapter called Race and the Royals, Institutional Bigotry and Denial. Meanwhile, the royal princes are jostling for the position of the most philanthropic, with Prince William attending the Earthshots Prize ceremony in Singapore and Prince Harry doing a comedy skit for the charity Stand Up for Heroes. Obviously, I was deeply honoured when Bob asked me to debut my stand-up act with you all tonight. I was so relieved to be invited back, but then I started to question whether his invite for me to actually do stand-up was in fact his idea of a joke. Either way, due to the shockingly low representation of gingers last year, and out of respect for my fellow endangered species, here I am, reporting for duty. Be still my oh, aching ha, sides. Ha, Be ha. still my aching sides. Uh, joining us now uh, is royal commentator and host of uh, the To Die For Daily podcast, Kinsey Schofield. Welcome, Kinsey. Hi, I did it last once, so you guys are giving him too much credit. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we, we weren't yeah. laughing That's either. That's called sarcasm. Yeah. Us Brits know what that is. Uh, Kinsey, <laughs> uh, look, look, there's a lot to get through here, but first off, I think probably the biggest story is next week it's the King's 75th birthday party up at Balmoral. Uh, it'll have a kind of dual purpose, this family gathering, because it's pretty much a year since the Queen died. So a very special event uh, for the royal family. Now, we're trying to get to grips with exactly who did what. But first of all, uh, we found out or we were told that Harry and Meghan were going to snub the King's birthday. They just weren't going to turn up. And then they have let it be known, no, 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 we weren't invited. Uh, either way, this is a serious indication of just how severe this family feud is within the House of Windsor. Correct. And I was with the Wales polo team over the weekend. Um, King Charles is their patron. And there were a lot of people and just that were, were watching the polo match that were connected to the royal family and had friendships within the royal family. And they told me that there was no reconciliation on the horizon, that there was just absolute shock over the betrayal, that no one thought that Prince Harry was capable of going as far as he did. And there is just, you know, an open wound when it comes to Prince Harry and the royal family. So I do believe that Prince Harry and Meghan were not invited to celebrate the King's birthday with the family, because I think the family is just in desperate need of peace right now. And Harry and Meghan are toxic. They're the absolute opposite of peace. And it's just not what the family needs to heal. I mean, they might want peace, but peace ain't going to be what they're going to get, is it? Because uh, Harry and Meghan's useful little mouthpiece, Omid Scobie, or Ovid Scabies, as I like to call him, has a new book coming out full of the intersectionality that he likes, making out like the royal family themselves, like Harry said, are an endangered species. I mean, how much do you think that uh, Omid takes his orders from on high and how cynically timed is the release of this book? I, well, you know, he's he's claiming that he's interviewed individuals within the royal family for the book. And, uh, you know, I, I, that leaves us with only two people, <laughs> Harry and Meg, Harry and Meghan. Uh, uh, if if they continue to claim that they don't work with Harry and Meghan like they did with Finding Freedom, which we found out was a lie, uh, then I'd say it would Princess Eugenie would should probably be pretty nervous because that's the only person that I could see maybe communicating with him other than Harry and Meghan and, and she's close in their corner. Um, 
you know, I, I imagine that that this is just another arm, another tentacle when it comes to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's just never ending revenge saga. Uh, some of the stories that we've heard so far, this Prince William is a tyrant headline. I just don't believe it. This is a guy that we've been criticizing for years because he wasn't working enough. So you're telling us behind the scenes he is so aggressive. It just doesn't make sense. Uh Kenzie, uh, Omid Scovey's new book's called Endgame, and in it is a chapter called, and I quote, Race and the Royals, Institutional Bigotry and Denial. Uh, so this is going to be more of the same, isn't it? More of what happened during the Oprah interview, where suddenly Harry and Meghan, uh, because Scobie is their mouthpiece, a shameless apologist for those two, uh, what he writes is what they say. This is sort of their book. Uh, so, basically, more of what happened in the Oprah interview, accusing the royal family, the British royal family, of being racists and bigots when there's absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, this is outrageous, isn't it? I think that the environment, the climate has changed. I mean, keep in mind that that was done in the middle of the George Floyd riots here in the United States. I mean, there was not a T-Mobile that had not been set on fire at the time that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry decided to have that sit down with Oprah Winfrey. And so I do think that the, you know, that just, that climate has changed here and it's not so in your face. But there's also been the evolution of people seeing the, the difference between the truth and Harry and Meghan's truth. The three hour or two hour car chase around New York City. Um, people now really truly question Harry and Meghan's version of events. And there is there is no question that the content within this book is Harry and Meghan's version of events. So I think people are going to be a little bit more critical of this new information unless you are full on board of team Harry and Meghan, and you're already on the crazy train. So there's no one, there's nothing we can tell you otherwise to change your mind. And uh, William, of course, is in Singapore pushing uh, publicity again for his Earthshot Prize. How important is this in building his personal brand ahead of him becoming king when his uh, father sadly passes away? I think that this is an amazing for um, Prince William's legacy because what the Earthshot Prize does is it gives sponsorships, grants to people that have amazing ideas when it comes to, uh, you know, ways that we can make the environment, uh, you know, just to, to, to slow down our carbon footprint. What he does is he helps to hand individuals huge chunks of cash so that they create something tangible um, that will inevitably save the environment in some way, shape, or form. So now there are all of these different projects going on all over the world that have Prince William's fingerprints on them. So, you know, something's going to save the day if he continues with Earthshot Prize and how incredible that he gets to say he's involved in it or that he discovered it or that he recognized it first. So I think it's incredible for his legacy. Uh, and I just think it was a very smart move, the, the development of this project. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kinsey. Uh, that's uh, the great... Always lovely having you on, She's Kinsey. She's brilliant, you brilliant to talk to you, as brilliant. always. She knows more about the royal family than anyone in Britain, doesn't she? That's what's remarkable she does. She's about American. all of this. She's I more know. interested in our royal family than us. Yeah, well, most of the that's gossip the way comes from over, over that side of the pond these days, doesn't it? Always it a pleasure, Kinsey. Royals. Thank you very much. Uh, no. Before we hand over to Peter Carble, we wanted to remind you of the moving plight of three Israeli mothers who have spoken to Talk TV exclusively about their children held by Hamas terrorists since October the 7th. Hadas Calderon, Renana Jacob and Batshiva Yahalomi have nine members of their families taken by the terrorists. Uh, Batshiva, whose husband Ohad, along with their elder son Aitan, is still missing. Describe the moment the 12 year old was taken. This was uh, the last moment I saw Etan, my son. His motorcycle continued to Gaza. Me and my two daughters, we managed to escape through the fields. So we right. went three and a half hours with pajamas, no shoes, no telephones. They took the, the phones. We don't know anything about Ohad and about Etan, my son. I know Ethan is alone, he's only 12. No child should be alone without his mother. 
Holding back tears, Renana, who wasn't at home at the time of the attack, recounts the last phone call she had with her son, Yegel, who was taken with his 16-year-old brother, Or. The last thing I heard was my 12-year-old, Yegel, begging, saying, don't take me, I'm too young. You can't take me, I'm too young. He was repeating it a couple of times and then the phone hung up and the line went off. And that was the last time I heard of them. Um, as the chairman said, we heard nothing since. We don't know anything of their whereabouts. We don't no know sightings. whether they're alive. We don't know for how long. Where they are, whether they're being taken care of. They're children. They're just children. And Hadas Calderon's son and daughter, Erez and Sahar, are also still missing, along with three other family members taken from their kibbutz last month. I want you to imagine, any mom in the world, to imagine for one minute your child, your young little boy or girl, being kidnapped suddenly with, from their safe house with pyjama from, pyjama from their bed. No shoes, no nothing. Just kidnapped like that. Cruelly way, merciless way, cruelly way. Been holding like that when they helpless, terrified, confused. And to watch the whole emotional and heart wrenching interview, tune into Prime Time with Rosanna Lockwood at 7 pm. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show now. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, so we'll do it again tomorrow, Alex. We'll do it again tomorrow. Two days down and many more to come. We've been really thoroughly enjoying your company. And fantastic word by this channel, Talk TV, and obtaining those interviews. So important that we remind the world. What happened on the 7th of October, one month ago today? Children, women, elderly people, among those hostages, over 200 of them still trapped, still trapped in tunnels yeah. far below Gaza City by the terrorist Hamas. Uh, um, and uh, don't forget, it's Armistice Day on Saturday, so we await uh, events uh, leading up to that big day. Will those marches go ahead? Uh, there seems to be a rising call for them not to happen. Yeah, including from the President of Israel himself talking exclusively to this channel. Well, thank you for tuning in. Please do join us at the same time, same place tomorrow. Up next is Peter Carbwell. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for watching.